Thanks for coming along. Um, well, I'm going to talk about IoT demo. Uh, the previous session, if you were here, we had some guys from Deutsche Bahn saying how they use IoT on real trains. I'm doing something much more fun, toy trains. Um, a, a little bit about myself. I actually did study electronic engineering, although my entire career has been software engineering. So until very recently, I mean, I hadn't picked a solder in art. Uh, a soldering iron up for over 30 years um, until IoT came along. Um, this demo is a collaborative effort. It's not just me. A number of members of the OSG Alliance have all contributed to make this demo happen. Um, my privilege is to be involved at the low-level side uh, with the hardware and the toys. So, uh, so I've had all the fun bits, or at least that's what I think. Um, the presentation, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think makes an impressive demonstration, and I'm going to do that um, with a bottom-up approach. So I'm going to start with the hardware and um, mechanical engineering. Um, in this case, it's Lego engineering. Um, some electronic engineering. This is actually playing with the things themselves that we're going to control, and, and then the software engineering to control the whole lot. Um, I'm sure you'll be interested to know what problems we encountered, because we did, um, but we resolved them. And although we were here last year, this year we have got a number of extensions to the demo. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. So, what makes an effective IoT demo? A cool UI. Yeah, of course. Or, possibly some things. I obviously have to admit to be a little biased here, but I actually think seeing the physical things moving hands down beats a UI. What it does do, of course, it will attract people to your stand if you're at an exhibition, and once they're at your stand, you can obviously explain your cool UI to them. So it's a win-win situation. Um, we first started thinking about this demonstration um, over a year ago in June 2015, and the original idea was for model cars, uh, which would be great the only thing is that we had concerns that if they were just running around on the floor and we didn't have perfect control of them, um, we wouldn't have control of them. So quite soon afterwards, um, we suggested trains. Now, the huge advantage of trains is that unless anything goes catastrophically wrong, they'll always be somewhere on the track, hopefully. Um, and our goal there, our high-level goal, we wanted to be a showcase for OSGI showing it was viable both for the low-level control of IoT devices and also for the control software running in the cloud. Um, so, off to the shops to buy a toy. But of course, um, we wanted to control it as an IoT device. So this means that we need actuators and sensors. So actuators are things that, um, that perform some action. 
So in terms of the train, we need to be able to set its speed. Um, setting the lights would be nice, but it's not mandatory. We certainly need to be able to control the track switches so the train goes where we want it to go. Setting the signals looks nice in a demo, but obviously is not vital to the operation of the train. Um, what is vital, though, is to get the location of the train. We need to know where it is on the track, otherwise um, all bets are off. Um, so what's in the box? Um, it might be obvious, but when you buy a Lego train, it works out of the box. I mean, you've got to assemble various bits, but you don't have to get the soldering iron out, you don't have to add anything. Um, so you get a battery-operated, infrared-controlled train, some track, and a load of bricks. Um, the controller is infrared, it's got four channels on it, so if you've got enough space and money, you can actually have four trains that you can control from one of these controllers. Uh, but what's missing? Right, no track signals in the box, um, no track switches or actuators so that we can operate them automatically, um, no sensors to detect the location of the train. So, this is where the uh, mechanical engineering comes in. We need to build some signals. You might thought I just went along to the Lego store and bought these. No, Lego do not manufacture signals anymore. If you look very hard on eBay, they used to, and they now attract a premium as collector's items. Um, a huge premium, like 100 euro or some ridiculous price like that. Um, so I, I, I delegated this task to my son, my 20-year-old my, my son, I might say, um, who, who actually found appropriate bits and made some very nice Lego signals um, with high-powered LEDs in the top. Um, and of course, once he'd built one, I said, that's great. Um, can you build another six? Um, the next problem is how do we control um, the switches? This is how you buy them from Lego, and I'm going to start handing some things around, so I do sort of pass them to that while I'm talking. Um, so a piece of track like that, not automatically controlled. Um, if we can start handing this around. Um, so um, your Lego do do motors, so somehow we needed to connect the motor to the switch together um, so that we could control it automatically. Again, this is not a kit you get from Lego, but we obviously wanted to do it using Lego. Um, and we had three or four prototypes. This is not as easy as it looked. Again, um, all of the credit to this goes to my son. Um, the first prototype, although it worked, it had the problem that when the motor overran, it was so strong, it would tear the Lego bricks apart. So eventually, um, sorry, I oh no. yeah. Right, sorry. Um, eventually, we, um, sat, uh, we settled on this design, which is the one you see on the demo now. It doesn't really show up in the picture, but we've got a very strong brace going here, which stops it pulling apart. And I've got one that we can hand around so you can see what we've done. Um, in order to do all this, uh, well, again, sorry, scale up. So my poor son, when he got one working, I said, that's great, make me another six. He's a good lad. Um, these parts, they are available. You've got to know the right place on the internet and order shed loads of stuff. Um, I say shed loads and, and, and loads. But, of course, when you do that, you do get certain benefits. Um, right, so how are we doing? So we've got track signals, we can, we've got track switch actuators, uh, but we haven't yet done anything about train location detection. So, this brings me into the electronic engineering phase, or thing engineering, as I'm calling it here. Um, location sensors. So, you know, this was a biggie. Um, not available from Lego. Um, we could use mechanical or magnetic switches. We thought a bit low tech, and, and they'd probably be difficult to detect multiple trains. Um, putting a barcode on the train, that was an idea, um, which we put on the table. Um, then using RFID readers and tags were suggested. Yeah, that looked promising. Uh, we found RFID readers were available for about you know, $5. Um, and we thought that if we had six fixed RFID readers around the track, and we put an RFID tag on each train, this would enable us to detect the location. Um, this is the RFID reader that we settled on. Um, it's actually got an area printed on the circuit board. Um, it's actually too big to go on the track there. That was just a sort of photograph I took to show its size. Um, but I actually did do some testing. 
Um, in this case, you can see on the train there, I've got a very large RFID tag the size of a credit card. And this is just prototyping, so if this worked, I'd have built a Lego gantry to stand the RFID reader on. Um, you'll probably recognize that as the box the Raspberry Pi came in. Um, right, so we seem to have train location sensors that worked. Um, they were supported by the Raspberry Pi because they actually use a, a, a serial peripheral interface bus, um, but that's supported by this fantastic GPIO connector on the Pi that can interface with most things. Um, before I had to write any software in OSGI or Java, there was a Python program on the Pi that could, um, that could operate this. The range was not great. It was only one to two centimeters because, of course, these tags are not designed to detect trains. They're designed for static card reading. But, but we thought they'd be OK. Um, so a little summary of where we are. So the actuators and sensors that we need. So the train speed and the lights, these are controlled by infrared as supplied by Lego. Um, the track signals, right, we've built those with high-powered LEDs. Um, the track switch actuators, again, we built those with Lego motors with my son's help. And the train location sensors, yeah, RFID looked like that was going to work. Um, now, although the Lego train is controlled um, using infrared, um, it uses a Lego handset like this. Um, we thought potentially we could take it apart and wire this directly into the Raspberry Pi. Um, but we felt, apart from being cheating, um, it also destroyed um, the infrared controller. So on investigation, we found that Lego have very uh, you know, obligingly published the protocol that the infrared uses to control the trains. Um, this is great. The only thing to notice here, um, we need some, some real time-ish like capability because the timings here are sub-milliseconds. You know, they're not huge, but we're going to run on a Raspberry Pi that's doing other stuff. So another happy coincidence is good old Linux has got a Linux infrared control project on it that can generically control infrared devices. And better still, it's installed on a Raspberry Pi by default. So all we needed to do from Java, from OSGI, was actually write a sequence of bytes to a Linux device driver. That would then take care of all the timing to actually um, to implement the infrared protocol. Um, we stole the code that was on the internet in C, and obviously a C to Java translation was quite trivial, as this was say, just writing a number of bytes to a device driver. Um, also in this picture, I'm showing the infrared LED could be something as simple as as this, which is just a 10 cent LED soldered onto a piece of wire. <laughs> um, but for the actual demo, we use something like this that actually costs 100 times more, $10. That's got four LEDs in that are pointing at different angles just to make sure you get coverage of the whole track. Um, right, on the right here, I'm showing the GPIO connector that comes on a Raspberry Pi. Um, because we want to drive um, the high-powered LEDs and the motors to change the track switches. Now, you can't do that directly from the Raspberry Pi because they take too much power. So we need to find some sort of driver chips or add-ons to the Pi that will enable us to do this. So um, searching the Raspberry Pi um, forums and the internet in general, there is no end to ways of doing this. Um, this is a chip here, connect the GPIO on the left-hand side and put a lamp or high-power LED on the right-hand side. Great, that will drive seven LEDs, cost 50 cents. Nice and easy. The motors are a bit more complex, but again, we found a chip here, $2. What we need to do to the motors, we need to connect the power either in forward or reverse. So to reverse it, we need to switch the power around. And that's exactly what this chip does. It shows you where you connect the motors, and then we can control it to the GPIO and that can turn the motors on forward, on reverse. If we needed to, we can use pulse width modulation to control their speed. Uh, we didn't actually need to do that in this case because we just power the switches on full for about five seconds and the switch has changed. Right, so all of this we wanted to connect to a Raspberry Pi. So one of the motor controller chips would control two motors, one of the LED drivers would control seven LEDs, two RFID readers. Yeah, so somehow we needed to connect that all neatly into one Pi. If we only had one Pi, we could have a sprawling set of wires, but we knew we needed at least three, 
Um, we wanted this to look nice, and in fact, we wanted it to be at least robust enough to be able to put on an airplane and it still work when it came off the other end. So, this is where I got my soldering iron out. Um, first attempt. Um, this, this does actually work. Um, it took me the best part of a day to put together. Um, I haven't soldered for, say, over 30 years, um, and, you know, quite complex to put together, um, but that worked. Um, I didn't really relish the thought of making three or four more of these, and even this, you know, is not that robust. So, what could I do? Um, I was pointed towards an open source electronic design program, fritzing.org, um, which is great. This is, this is a really good example of a model view controller application. So the model is in there. This is the physical view of how I might have actually connected it on a breadboard to get it working. It's then got a schematic view, which is the actual chips and interconnections that are going on. But the reason I use this design tool is it's actually got a physical printed circuit board layout view. And what's more, they've got a sister site where you can fabricate your design in small quantities. So I didn't have to make 100,000 of these or even 100. I was able to fabricate, I could have fabricated just one. I fabricated six. They were just under 100 euros, but so that's 15 euros each for you know, a very high quality board, um, which this took me half an hour to assemble. So if I pass that around, so obviously it looks very professional, um, much more robust, much faster to assemble. Um, Fritzing.org is a community site, so I've actually I've published this design up there. If anyone wants to do this themselves, you can go there, download the design, and fabricate it yourself. Right, so we've done hardware. Um, we've done the electronics. So this is where we start doing a little bit of software, not too much. Um, so we've got an OSGI service model. We've got some high-level services, which are running in the cloud. So we've got a track manager service. It's looking after the track, the state of the signals, the state of the switches. We've got a number of train managers, one train manager for each train, but that asks the track manager for permission to do things. The only thing the train manager does directly is control the train. So if the train manager has asked the track manager for permission, it can actually control the train to stop or to go forwards. It does that. Um, the services at this level are the lower level services that are provided by the hardware we've built and it's actually running on a Raspberry Pi. So a train controller service will effectively have a method on it saying, you know, move forward or backwards um, and turn the lights on and off. We've got a similar segment controller service, or in fact a number of them. Some will change the signal states, some will change the switch states, and another will, re will report the RFID position. Um, not only are they OSGI services, they are remote OSGI services, which really helps our deployment. So from a deployment point of view, we can have um, a number of Raspberry Pis. So in fact, we've got three Raspberry Pis, each having two switches, two signals, and two RFID readers connected to them, presenting themselves as remote OSGI services. So our server software is oblivious to where they're actually running, which is great. We didn't have to reconfigure, it's just looking for these services. And on the left-hand side, we've got the um, train control service, which is actually driving the infrared. Um, this is the only code slide, this is the only code slide I'm gonna show you, so don't get too frightened. Um, this is the code to control uh, one of the signals. Um, First thing to notice, so we've used OSGI declarative services, which is the app component at the top. Um, it's a remote service, which is the service exported interfaces equals star. Um, and it requires configuration. Um, it doesn't look like this in Eclipse. This is a sort of cut and paste montage. Um, the configuration is a bit of JSON I've got on the right hand side there. And basically it is saying which GPIO pin on the Pi is connected to the red and green LEDs and also which signal number is it. We've got six signals, so it needs to know, you know which of the six signals it is. When we've got that information, when this component activates, to create, um, it just needs to use that configuration to create well, a green variable, which if we look up here, it is a GPIO pin digital output. That is actually uh, one of the, f 
that is one of the features of that is one of the features of on route which is actually got a pi interface library which means you can talk directly from a pi using osgi on route without having you know a uh, you know, using any, I think it probably uses Pi for J internally, but you don't need to know that. We've got, we've got a class there that can directly control the GPIO pins. The method that does the work is here. So signal, we tell it the color we want to go to. So if it's green, it sets the green pin on and it sets the red pin off. And if it was flashing, it sets that off as well. Um, the motor works in a similar way, but um, obviously the motor only needs to run for a short amount of time until it's changed. Um, we're quite crude here. We don't know how long to run it for, so we're running it for five seconds because we know that's more time than we need. So if you look at the demo, you'll probably hear click, 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 which is when we've run the motor too much. As I explained already, the Lego is strong enough that it doesn't break apart when we do that. Right, so that's the bulk of the demo. I mean, we're still just over halfway through the talk, so I guess I've got some time to tell you about some problems we had. Right, so remember how I said the RFID would probably be okay. Um, I'm an optimist. It wasn't. Um, the first problem was, um, yeah, when you buy um, RFID readers for, you know, five dollars off eBay that have probably come from China, um, yeah, you get what you pay for. Um, although they appeared to be working when I tested them at home, when we came here, only two out of the six we had were still working. Um, and when we set them up in the real demo, with I guess the extra noise and lights that are around, the range that I observed at home was not observed here, so it really wasn't practical. Um, we had other issues with the demo last year, so we'd really only found this problem out at about 6 p.m. on the Monday night. Um, so at 7, we dispatched a couple of people down to Stuttgart to see if any electronic shops were still open. Um, happily they were, and they came back with a bunch of um, these. So we've now gone low tech. Um, this is a micro switch, mechanical micro switch, um, that we glued to a piece of Lego. Um, and then we snap those onto the track. So we've now got a mechanism of detecting when a train runs over here. Of course we have to rewrite some code, but good old Pi, the GPIO, we now reprogram some pins as inputs to detect when this switch is operated. The rest of the software doesn't need to change. Our whole service model is just the same. It still gets, you know, a train has been located. The implementation of how we're locating trains has changed. But, you know, oh, but that's only um, apparent at the lower level in the Raspberry Pi. Um, we have some other problems, but I'll talk to those about in questions if we've got time. Um, we had quite a discussion about whether to come back this year with a train, because we said we did a train last year, everyone's seen that, you know, it's not going to attract as many people. And we actually talked a long time about that, you know, we actually wanted to bring drones and various other things in here. But, you no, know, we said what we're actually trying to show is that OSGI is evolvable and that we can extend the demo without having to start from scratch again. And that's what we've done. Um, one of, of, of the key extensions is actually making the location mechanism work correctly. Um, we could have just thrown RFID out as not being suitable for tasks, but we felt we hadn't really given it a chance. We'd used the first and cheapest RFID detector we could find, um, and we thought if we looked a little harder and thought a little longer, this is still probably the, you know, the best technology. So we wanted a better RFID reader, and as well as doing that, we thought it would really be good if we could actually mount the reader on the train and then we could have lots of really cheap passive tags all around the track, so we could locate it everywhere rather than just at a few locations where we put readers. So, next exhibit. Um, Five dollar RFID reader, Mark II. Um, this is actually different RFID technology. You see, rather than having its coil, its area printed on the card, it's, it's a coil of wire. That's because it's actually running at a much lower frequency. This is running at 125 kilohertz, rather than 30 megahertz. But I thought, in fact, you know, lower tech, you know, maybe this is going to detect the trains better. Um, and rather than connecting to the Raspberry Pi um, SPI serial bus, it produces good old um, serial, so you could connect it to a serial console and you could see RFID codes coming out. Um, we did then, of course, have to um, find suitable tags that we could put on the track without obstructing the train. Um, 
quite a lot of tags are available, but not, I mean, a dollar doesn't seem much, but we wanted to buy about 100 of them. So uh, we were looking around for a cost-effective tag. This is a selection of tags that I bought to work out which one would work best. As part of this exercise, I actually found that these key fob tags are really cheap, about 10 cents each. And although we couldn't put a key fob on the track, um, the fob on the left, you can actually prise the black bit out and put it on the track. That worked really well. So having bought 10 as a sample, I then bought 100 for production. The 100 was a different design. If you see on the right, the coil of wire is glued directly inside. So if I broke that, um, so then that was no good. So I had to look again for tags. And happily, I found the perfect tags. Um, not quite as cheap as I wanted, but they do come, they're already self-adhesive, um, and they're thin, and they work. Um, another problem, of course, is we had a serial output now on the train. Now, we didn't want the train connected via a serial cable, because obviously uh, that would um, be rather silly. Um, and again, happily, scanning the devices that are out there, this little device here takes a serial input and transmits it over Bluetooth. So, although I'd have loved to put a Raspberry Pi on the train, uh, we, th that involves space, power consumption, all the rest. Here, I just needed to connect this little device up to the previous device, and we get the RFID event sent out over Bluetooth. Um, then I had a problem, obviously, we had to fit these onto the train somehow. So, here you see all the bits in the, So, this is the battery box that comes with the train. So this is the Bluetooth, the RFID, a power supply for both of them. Um, it's, uh, there's some space, but there's not a lot, because LEGO aren't actually intending you to fill their trains with electronics. Um, here you can see, this is a happy coincidence that the RFID coil um, actually fits under the train. Um, but you can see quite, quite tight for wires inside. Um, yeah, very tight, um, but it just about fitted. Um, we've changed the service model slightly when we came to the RFID. Um, because we needed Bluetooth, we actually decided to take advantage of the Eclipse Cure project, which has already got Bluetooth support. Um, and as we were using a different platform, we thought rather than just use the remote services that we knew worked, um, the purpose of this is a demonstration of capability. So we thought, well, you know, let's show a different way of connecting. So in this case, um, from Cura, we were receiving the Bluetooth location events, and we published them up to MQTT, and then we subscribed to those to get the train location. Um, this is a second extension that we thought about. Um, we've added passengers and stations, and we wanted a way for the passengers to be able to check in. So we thought, guess what? we can use these RFID readers that we know work and all those hundred tags that we bought that are no use. We can connect the RFID reader. We don't need Bluetooth. We can connect it to a serial port. But hey, um, hardware refactoring is more difficult than software refactoring. This lovely board we built did not have provision for a serial port. So hardware modification, not almost as neat as in software. So in summary, what makes an effective demo? Let people see the devices actually doing stuff. That will draw them to your stand, regardless of how oblique it is to what you're actually doing. Then you can show them a UI of whatever your product really does. I've given you bottom-up view, starting with things that might seem trivial, but you know the Lego engineering was, was more work than we expected. Playing with things is great fun, and I think you don't have to buy everything off the shelf. Repurposing these cheap devices is great fun, and again shows you know what can be done with a bit of ingenuity. Um, and again, what we're showing is that it hooks into the OSGI platform, no problem at all. Um, it wasn't without problems, but we worked around them, we've resolved them, and we've extended the demo. So, if anyone's got any questions, I'll be quite happy to try and answer them. Uh, I did have some help um, during the construction of the equipment, as you can see. And in fact, during the RFID tag testing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my colleague Walt here um, did the cure stuff. I'm afraid I didn't give him a longer platform, but I'm sure he'll answer.